Oh, so someone wants to steal from me. Whoever it was in this dorm that stole from me is a weak-hearted son of a... Welcome back to another episode of Grow With Me, Sawyer P, where we grow together, not apart. And I want to thank you all for tuning in. For those who have subscribed, who have taken the time to follow me and like my videos and share and comment and all that stuff, it's so helpful. And um, I got a story today about my experience when I was doing time in a county jail in Harlan, Kentucky. Um, please, if you do enjoy these videos, please just take a moment to like, uh, subscribing, commenting, any type of interaction, engagement with the video helps so much because as a YouTuber or a person that aspires to be a YouTuber, um, it helps the algorithm, it helps YouTube's algorithm to pick up my video and to suggest it to other people, and uh, which leads to more views and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, if you, if you out of the kindness of your heart to do that for me, you know, if you enjoy this type of content and the stuff I've been sharing with you guys, please, uh, Please do that, and I'd be eternally grateful to y'all, and um, appreciate that, and continue to try to push out some good stories and good content uh, about prison, um, and, and you know, uh, true crime, things of that nature. You know, that's the uh, focus of this channel, is to share stories about prison, uh, 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 you know, incarceration, true crime, uh, crazy stories that I've seen, and experiences of others. Um, and, uh, you know, even prison reform, you know, it's something I'm passionate about because it was a big part of my life. And I want to share that with you all. And it also helps me a lot. Getting these things off my chest, I've found to be therapeutic. While there is some risk involved of putting myself out there and putting my business out there to the public, it's, I found it to be helpful. And um, I enjoy doing it. And, you know, I, you know, I got, a, I think, close to 50 subscribers now, which... Might not seem like a lot, but if it even helps one person, I'm happy, you know. I'm grateful for that and um, appreciate every single last one of you guys. And hopefully we can see this thing grow together. You know, we grow together, not apart, y'all. Just like my uh, my motto on the channel here. So, uh, I just left the gym and did a little leg workout. Ooh, I'm trying to get right, get right, you know what I mean? Get my weight up, not my hate up. Ooh, but, um... <laughs> It's always been something I've been into, but um, so today, my experience of serving time in Harlan County Detention Center. This was in the year, oh, let's see, I got actually picked up Christmas Day 2012, and was there till uh, I think around uh, June-ish. I wasn't there too long. I wasn't there too long, June of 2013, May 2013. I think it was like towards the end of May of 2013, actually. And I ended up having to go to New York and doing my time up there because I was on interstate parole and violated. I had to go back to New York to serve my time for an 18-month parole violation. <clears throat> so, oddly enough, you would think being prison sounds a bit more daunting than county jail. And typically speaking, it is. There's a lot more serious people uh, in there. There's more gangs and things of that nature. County jail, there's a lot more crackheads and you know, people coming in and out off the street and stuff, you know, but um, of all the places I have done time, Harlan County Detention Center, they call it Hard Times Harlan, and they call it that for a good reason. That particular spot was probably the most, I didn't see the worst act of violence I ever seen, but in terms of Conflict occurring like high frequency of conflict and violence and fighting, you know It was usually it was always fights and people get jumped, you know, never any weapons But I mean people do get hurt pretty bad sometimes in those fights, you know And of, of all the spots I've been that place had the most drama going on all the time And there was a good reason for that that particular facility um, You know it, it's a dorm setting uh, some some of the, it's weird. Some of the beds go three high bunk beds. You know, there's most jails have two bunks. You know, this one had some that were three, and there were some other double racks. You know what I mean? But um, and they were small dorms. There's no windows in it. There's two toilets, two showers, 
um, a TV, you got cards, you got instant coffee, there's no microwave, no stoves, no, we do get a cooler full, full of ice, we can put our pot, our soda in, and sometimes we'll like make a, a, like frozen cakes in it out of like the different candy bars and snacks off the commissary. But outside of that, there, there's not a lot of amenities. We never ever get to go outside, unless you're in a state inmate convicted dorm, there's a state dorm, they get to work outside sometimes. There's like a little farm where they grow produce and some of them get to work out on the roads, picking up trash, things of that nature. The females go to the uh, dog pound, the county dog pound and, um, you know, like work with the dogs there, which actually sounds kind of cool for a jail job, you know, but um, us regular guys waiting, going to, going to court to take a plea or go to trial or whatever, or waiting to go to prison. Um, there's not much for us there, and there's not a lot of privileges. So, I mean, when you're, you ain't got much to lose. And when you ain't got much to, to lose and not a lot of hope, and you close, crammed in there like sardines in a can, um, it tends to increase friction, stress. You're in each other's face. You're around people you don't want to be around. It's loud. It's hard to sleep good. You know, once those lights flick on in the morning, people are loud in the morning. You got to make your buds and does kind of help. I mean, they do help a little bit, but it's miserable. It's miserable, and I think that a lot of that had the re a reason to do with why there was so much drama there. You know, people getting hurt, fighting. And this particular spot, <clears throat> in that short period from Christmas Day 2012 to, I want to say it was around May, like, 20th-ish, roughly, when I got out, give or take, somewhere right in that range. It might have that's probably not the exact date, but it was roughly around that time, May 20th, 2013. Um, so just in that short time frame, you know, I got in three fights, and I could have gotten a lot more. There were other situations where there's confrontations and kind of settled it being diplomatic or someone got punked down. You know, I'll be honest, there's a few times where I was disrespected and I let it go, and I probably shouldn't have. I'm not trying to sound like Billy Badass or anything like that, pardon my French, but... At that point in time, you know, I was a lot less, more, um, more apt to, oops, hold on a second, guys. Okay, sorry about that. Guys, I had to adjust something on my phone, my camera. I have a little microphone and a light I didn't turn on, so hopefully you guys can see and hear me good, but hopefully you, the audio is a little better now. But anyways, at that point in time in my life, I was a bit more, I would say, you know, not scared, but a bit more passive and tried to avoid fighting. I didn't like fighting, and I still don't like fighting to this day, but I absolutely will if a situation calls for it. I'm not afraid to fight. I'm not afraid to get hit. I'm not afraid to hit someone if it's necessary. Of course, I always try to avoid that. You know, violence is not the answer to everything. However, it is necessary sometimes, especially in places like that. Some people only respect violence. So, um, you know, three, three fights in a short, you know, like, five month period I was there roughly four and a half five months <clears throat> you know and there could have been probably up to six or seven you know potential fights of situations that I kind of you know uh, I don't know just tried to ignore or whatever you know which sometimes I regret that I should have dealt with some of those situations differently but <clears throat> so I'll get into the story y'all so I get there Christmas Day um, you know, I'd, I'd been charged with a bunch of crimes, theft, stealing a shotgun, and, uh, uh, um, a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum. I had a bunch of stolen credit cards and, uh, you know, stolen jewelry, a whole bunch of stuff I had, you know, trying to feed an addiction to opiates. You know, at that time, the Roxy 30s were huge and, you know, Suboxone. You know, I kind of go on and off. If I had a good bit of money, I was doing Roxy's. If I was kind of more broke, I was doing Suboxone. And, and I was also doing cocaine. You know, booting them, you know. If you know what I mean when I say booting them. But, um, so, you know, I had kind of a, a pretty bad, you know, normally I, I like cocaine or heroin and cocaine, typically. But that area, heroin hadn't really been in that area yet. Now I'm pretty sure it's all through there. That, well, meth's probably the biggest thing there now. But, so I get picked up on that. First few weeks I'm there, I'm going through withdrawals, so I'm laying on the rack, feeling sorry for myself. I was going through a breakup too. I was in a relationship with a girl named Whitney, uh, me, you know, that I loved, and she loved me, but it was a very toxic relationship, a very drug fueled, um, unhealthy relationship where we, 
you know, uh, we just weren't good for each other because we were both addicts and, you know, we both had bad coping skills and childhood trauma and uh, as a way to cope with that, we would do drugs or get drunk together. It started off with drinking and escalated and escalated into the worser and harder things. But, uh, you know, when I got locked up, it's very common for relationships to end. If you have a girl that rides through you through a bid, she's solid, man. That's rare. You know, even wives a lot of time leave their husbands, you know. <clears throat> Most of the time, it's out of sight, out of mind. They can't wait. They can't be alone. And... I would say 90-ish percent of the time, they leave you. And that's the same for if a woman gets locked up or a man, at very least cheats on her while she's in there. He might stay around, but usually they get left too. You know, it's just how it is. When you're in there, people forget about you. Out of sight, out of mind. But, uh, so, you know, those first few weeks, I was coming off the subs. I was coming off the Roxy's, the Coke, you know, and just super depressed knowing that our relationship was over. So I was, like, borderline suicidal. I, I, I didn't have the balls to do that, but I just felt like dying, you know, combination of the breakup and the withdrawals. And as soon as I went in there, I, I knew it was a madhouse. It was very toxic. Um, you know, there was, it was mostly whites. This is the one jail I've been to. Well, I've been to two jails, actually, but this one especially where there was way more whites than there was blacks or Hispanics. It was primarily white people, white country, hillbilly boys, you know. And, you know, uh, very, very country folk, you know, Harlem's darn near like a third world country with its poverty and drugs, you know, as anyone that's been in that area knows, you know, it's uh, very, very backwards there, so to speak, you know, and uh, so these people, the majority of them were meth heads, but a lot of them were, had done opiates and other drugs, you know, but at the time, meth was big. A lot of the time, that meth was cut with bath salts. That was a big problem right around that time period. Um, bath salts, you know, making people have psychosis and lose their mind. But meth also does that, too. I, I genuinely, I can tell a lot of the time upon meeting someone that's clean now that they used to be a meth addict by their demeanor, a lot of time they talk fast, they have a very short attention span, they get angry and frustrated easily and quickly. And a lot of these guys, I think, had meth-induced psychosis or meth-induced mental health problems. By all, you know, a lot of us probably, they had it before they started doing drugs, but the meth, you could tell, definitely did some type of uh, brain dysfunction or damage, you know, to them. So, <clears throat> um, I get in there. A lot of the times they're, uh, they're taping like sheets around their hands and boxing each other and laying mats on the floor and wrestling. It's just very hostile, very wild. They're in there snorting coffee, instant coffee, thinking it will help them with withdrawals, trying to get me to do it. And they blow their nose and it looks like crap comes out of their nose. It's disgusting. But um, there was one little fight I had, you know, some dude. Yeah, I won't talk about that one too much because it was just a few punches or whatever, you know. Some dude, like, they put a battery on his back. So let me say this first. I grew up in New York. I clearly don't have a strong southern accent, you can probably tell. And when you're an outsider there, a lot of people don't like people that aren't from there. They're suspicious of them, they're wary of them. I don't know if they think you're going to come in and take their women, but it's a very territorial kind of place. <laughs> Which, on the outside there, I got along with so many people, you know, I, I dated several girls and been friends with, you know, several dudes and got along, you know, it was fairly well liked, but in there it was different, you know, they call me New York, <clears throat> you know, because where I grew up in New York, and there was, initially there was a lot of, there was a good bit of disrespect amongst a few dudes, and one, you know, the first fight I got into, like I said, I won't touch on that too much, they put a gap battery on this kid's back and said, oh, uh, I bet, you know, I bet he talked smack behind your back talking about me, saying I talked smack, you know, and, and, you know, the kid just calls me out out of nowhere, and we go in the corner and fight, and I would say I probably got the better of him, not to sound like Billy Badass or nothing, but I did, you know, I did, I was in my socks, too, and in there you got flip-flops, you can buy shoes, like Jackie Chan shoes without strings or Velcro, I hadn't bought a pair of those yet, you know, but I did later on because you need to have shoes if you're going to be fighting. <clears throat> so, 
you know, this kid calling me out. We fight. I get the better of him. You know, I bust his, you know, I busted, uh, where did I get him? I gashed his forehead, I think. I know he was leaking somewhere. I think I gashed him when I hit him. Knuckle kind of drags and it rips the skin a little bit. He got a few shots in on me, but he was very kind of clumsy and awkward and not quick, you know, just kind of clumsy with his movements. But I got the better of him. And after that, it was just left it alone. I don't know why. I'm like, dude, I didn't have no issues with you. You started this with me. But anyways, that's not the story I really want to talk about. So later on down the road, they move us from that dorm to a different dorm. Our dorm was actually right next door to the female dorm. And a lot of the time, the females would slide love notes under the door, like sex notes and sometimes tobacco because they were at the dog pound, so they would find ways to get cigarettes and drugs dropped off, or they'd pick cigarette butts off the ground and pour the last little bit of tobacco out and sneak it back into the facility. And my cousin was in there at the time. She actually slid me some tobacco under the door a few times, and, you know, I smoked with the door. I was generous. I shared with everybody, you know, with most people, you know. We found a way to, way to light it by popping a socket, which I'll share how to do that in a later video. But, you know, trying trying to be cool with people in there, but, you know, people in there were just crazy. Like I said, that meth, psychosis, crazy white boy, redneck mentality. They ended up moving us out of that dorm to a different unit, probably because of the female situation. I think they caught wind of that, us communicating with them. So they moved us out of that dorm to a different dorm. We moved up whole entire dorm to a different unit that was empty and it's about a 30 bad unit roughly so we get over there there's a poker table guys play poker that's a good way to pass time the commissary is very small they sell a lot of candy bars um, soda instant coffee like little Maxwell house packets that were like I don't know 25 or 50 cents a pop which coffee is like gold in there um, a lot of junk food, hot mama sausages, you know, chips, things like that. None of it had very much nutritional value to it. It wasn't good for you by any means. So um, we get over there, there's a poker table. I played poker some, but there's always a lot of drama coming off that table and bad energy, so I kind of fell back from it. And one day we're over there, there's a kid named Paul, Paul Buell. He, um, <laughs> We got into an argument. So a lot of guys in there, they're IV drug users. They shoot, they inject drugs with a needle, with a syringe. And we had got into an argument. <clears throat> There's a rumor in the drug community that you can infect yourself with hepatitis C by using the same needle over and over again, even if you didn't share it with someone, which is not true. The hep C virus has to have a host you know, it has to come from a host body. It doesn't just appear. Now, you can get bacterial infections like that, but the hep C virus needs a host to survive. You can't just pull it out of your arm and then it festers in the blood because a little bit of blood gets in the needle every time you use a needle. It doesn't just fester and build in there and then you poke yourself with it again and infect yourself. You have to share it with somebody. Blood to blood contact it has to happen. Blood from one person infected has to go to another person that's not infected, period. One way or another, you know, the blood has to enter your blood, period. So a lot of the time, even sexual contact, you can't get it unless there's blood-to-blood -blood contact in that process somehow. You know, it doesn't happen through the fluids and stuff. Sorry to be gross and graphic, but just being real. So me and him get into to a debate about this. He's saying you can't infect yourself, and his doctor told him. I'm like, dude, I've talked to several doctors, and... Um, people that work in clinics that deal with um, STIs, you know, sexual transmitted infections, and various infections and viruses, and have spoke to a nurse and doctors directly about this out of curiosity, you know, because I was a drug user, I wanted to, to be informed about this. And then we got to a big argument, and at the end of the argument, he's like, you know, he starts calling me a bitch. He's like, bitch, he's like, you always think you know everything, da 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 da, bitch, 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 bitch this, bitch that, trying to punk me. And I'll be honest, you know what? I turn that fight, I'm like, you know what, Paul, you're crazy, bro. You know, I just left it alone. I'm like, you know what, you're right, you're right, you're right. You know, I didn't want to go to the hole, I didn't want to fight him. I wasn't really, I wasn't scared of him. But a lot of those dudes in that dorm didn't like me just based off the fact I was from New York, you know? I don't know why, but they just didn't. They just didn't like outsiders for some reason. And I tried to be cool with everyone in there. Generally, I, I get along great with people. 
most people. So I let that slide the following day or two, there's some tension. And about two days, two, three days later, a dude named Matt, he was in there for a bank robbery. Him and his cousin robbed a pizza hut um, at gunpoint and uh, took off with the money as armed robbery. They ended up getting caught, having to do some time. They're out now, but they did a few years on it. And uh, he asked me if he could borrow a candy bar from the poker table. He said he would trade me his breakfast. Uh, we get a donut and cereal in the morning. He said he'd give me a donut or a donut and cereal for a candy bar, which is, that's a fair trade. It's a very common trade. Because he, he lost all his money on the poker table. He was very reckless with how he bet it. He'd go all in on a pair of fives, you know what I mean? He'd just he'd have garbage hands and go all in, you know. And I didn't want him to, I'm thinking in my mind, okay, if I credit this kid and he loses, he's not going to have nothing to eat the next morning. And then what if he don't want to give it to me? So I'm like, nah, bro, I don't want to do it. You know, I told him I don't have that much. I, you know, I've got enough to last me until commissary day. So I don't want to do it. And he seemed a little upset. He's like, all right, whatever, you know. And I thought that was that. You know, we left it at that. I, um, after dinner every day, I kind of had a little routine in there. Every day after dinner, I go, I get a shower. Cleaned up, I wash up. You know, there's a little single shower stall with a curtain. There's two of them on opposite walls. And I go, I shower. And at the time, I kept most of my commissary, except for stuff that would pop, like, um, like bags of chips. You can't put that under your mat, it would get crushed. But under the pillow part of my mat, where your headrest, I would put like my candy bars. I had a little sock where I would keep uh, my, I'd put my Maxwell co uh, Maxwell packets of coffee down in that sock, kind of to hold them all, a little, <clears throat> and all that. So I go, I shower, I come back, I, you know, dry off, I walk back, I'm like in my boxers. And uh, we have like a two piece jumper, like a shirt top white t-shirt under it and a shirt bottom. Some places have like a onesie jumper, but this place had two-piece uh, uniforms. So, you know, I put my boxes on, my, my uh, lower pants on. I go back, I'm kind of like drying my feet off, getting ready to put my, put my socks on, my shirt's still off. I pull my mat up to grab something or just to look under there to make sure everything was good. I kind of would check under there a few times a day, make sure everything was still there. And several of my candy bars were missing. Not all of them, but I would I think there was about four or five missing. Clearly, it was obvious, like Three Musketeers, Milky Ways, things of that nature were missing, Snickers. And I immediately knew in my head, like, you've let stuff slide, you can't let this slide. Because if you let this slide, it's going to continue to happen. And people are going to prey upon you. And I knew I had, I had to do something about it. So the intro of the video, you know, what I said at the intro, I knew, you know, in this situation, there's really only way, one way you can do it. I mean, you can try to investigate and ask people who did it and try to figure it out. I had my suspicions that it was the Matt dude who asked me off the jump or Paul, who we had just had that argument with, him trying to get even or whatever, you know, because we had that argument. Even, even though I did nothing to him, we were just having a debate about Hep C. So, you know, um, after, after this happened, I pulled my socks back off. I think I had my shirt on at that point, or no, I don't even think I had it on. I pulled my socks off. The fighting in your socks will slip and slide everywhere and fall. Stand up, I go right in the middle of the dorm. If you guys are playing cards, if you guys are watching TV, but it was quiet. There was tension because I think people knew. People had seen what they did. You know what I mean? It's an open dorm and small. Everybody knows everything that's going on. You can't really hide anything in there. And I stand in the middle and I make an announcement. I said, whoever the weak-hearted son of a bitch is, or the weak-hearted whore that took my stuff is a pussy. And that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to make an announcement. I said, you know, say whoever the individual or individuals are that took my stuff is a pussy or a weak-hearted whore. That's kind of like the ultimate disrespect in the, that jail, you know, calling them a, a bitch, a whore, or telling them they're weak-hearted. And uh, there was a dude over, he just got off the phone, dude named Kevin Burkhardt, he just got off the phone, hung up, was like sitting there, I think he was waiting. This dude, he, he's just the type that's itching for a fight. His girl was outside on the street, cheating on him, he's always arguing on the phone. You know, all the time he's, you whore, da da da, and he slammed the phone up on her, you know, she was a meth head, he's a meth head on the street, you know, he did other drugs, but meth was his big thing, <clears throat> so... 
he was itching for a fight. You could just tell this dude, you know, and, and there's a few times he looked at me sideways, like sizing me up. I could tell he didn't like me. It's just, you know, and at the time I was smaller, I was more timid at that point in my life. You know, I hadn't done a whole lot of time. And people, they like to shark on the guys that are a bit more, that are younger. I was 23, that are less experienced, the more like calm and chill, you know. And uh, a little more timid, you know. Not timid, I don't know if that's the right word, but just passive. That don't like fighting, you know. And as soon as I say that, I make that announcement. He stands up, he takes his socks off, he takes his shirt off. And he starts approaching me, and Paul, the dude I got in the fight with, approaches, stands up too, and they start cussing at me, you know, he said, and this dude, Donnie, he was one of the guys that did the bank robbery, he pulls my mat off the bed, drags it to the door, he said, get on the fucking button, you're signing in. I said, I said, put me on that door. I said, y'all are going to have to kick, you know, y'all are going to have to whoop my ass and drag me to that door and press the button. I ain't going nowhere. Like, I'm not punking like that, you're not, you're not punking me out of the dorm, it's just not happening, I said, you have to put me on the button, it's not fucking happening, and those four individuals, you know, they, they look like they're about to jump in, and the funny thing is, none of those four were the one that took it, Matt was the one, I ended up finding out that took it, the one that asked me to borrow the candy bar for the poker table, but um, apparently Kevin had ate a few pieces, you know, he broke the candy bar in half and shared it with people, and Kevin... The dude that's always arguing with his girl that's cheating on him on the phone. Kevin um, ate some of it, so he felt like it was directed at him. Plus, he was just one of those types that's itching for a fight. He approaches me first. They all kind of like gang. I'm about to get jumped. They're about to jump me. And I'm grateful for this dude. Um, Seals. Mark Seals, his name is. Uh, older guy, probably about 40 at the time. He's from... Uh, you know, he's from like, uh, 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 what's it called? Tennessee, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, not Murfreesboro, Middlesbrough, Tennessee. He stands up, he said, listen, y'all ain't going to jump him. If y'all want to run a one-on-one -on -one with him, cool. You know, but he didn't let them jump me. You know, he kind of stood with me on that. Like, y'all want to fight a fair one with him, shoot a fair one with him, cool. But you ain't jumping him. And he stood up for me with that. And I, re I appreciate it. I respect it. And, you know, I tried to repay the favor to him later on for that. But I respect that man and appreciate it. he saved me from potentially getting jumped by four dudes. Potentially five if Matt got involved. And these dudes ain't small. They're all of them got some size. They're bigger than me. Pretty much all of them are bigger than me, you know. That time I wasn't working out a lot. You know, I wasn't in the best shape. I was doing a little bit of push-ups and pull-ups, but not seriously and consistently. And uh, so they respect it. And Kevin comes up. He approaches me first. I take my shoes off. My shirt's off. He approaches me, he swings, boom, I dodge, and I, boom, I, I hit him with a jab, boom, and I split his lip, boom, I mean, I fired him up, bro, I hit him twice, boom, boom, busted his lip, he's leaking immediately, immediately leaking, and you tell that guy I'm mad, because he missed his shots, and I connected good, so he charges in on me, and like, he tries to do the common, the also common scoop slam, where you wrap your arms around someone's knees, and boom, he tries to do that, but I know a good defense for that is to sprawl, what's called sprawl. You shoot your legs back and lock your knees, because if your knees are bent, they can hook behind. If your knees are locked, they can't really scoop slam you. So he tried doing it, I locked my knees, and I'm like, hold, you know, I'm trying to push down on the top of his head and his back like this. And he lifts me up, but he can't, like, do this number, and he just charges, and boom! He slams me into the door, and it, whoo, it knocked the wind out of me bad, man. And we both slide down and hit the floor, man. It knocked the wind out of me bad. And he got on he got on me. He was he had me mounted, but not a full mount. If you know anything about MMA, you can do what's called a half guard or a full guard defense where you get your legs around him. And I put the full guard around his his hip waist area so he couldn't get his legs up on my chest and just bop, bop, bop. And uh, so that helps me defend a lot by wrapping my legs around his waist. And mind you, when we fell, we fell near the toilets. There's water from the shower over there. People probably pissed on the floor. We're over there fighting, rolling around, and it was disgusting. Disgust. It was the worst. And I was like, yo, stand us up, stand us up, you know, because we're rolling around and pissing. He, he's trying to, like, push my hands down, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm defending good. I'm hitting a little bit, and he's trying to kind of hammer fist me, but I'm blocking. I'm blocking. I connected, like, one up on him, but I'm blocking. They stand us back up. And at that point, he's gassed. He walks away. 
he walks, you know, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm gassed and winded too because we just, you know, kind of had it out. But anyone that's been in a fight knows that it's easy to get winded super fast. So here comes Big Mouth Paul, the dude I argued with about Hep C. He's like, all right, bitch, let's go, let's go, you know, saying this to me. I'm like, all right, come on, motherfucker, come on, let's get it. You know, and I, I didn't have but maybe 45 seconds of rest after fighting Kevin that I fought him. So he's got an advantage. He's got his full win. And uh, he charges me, and I freaking hook. Boom! I always get, a, I always connect at least one or two good punches every fight I get in. Right in his forehead, man. It's not, you know, ideally you want to catch him in the chin and try to get that knockout. Caught him in the forehead. And he it instantly lumped up. Instant unicorn knot, man. He had it for like a week, man, on his head. And, um, he, you know, he, he's go-to. Me and him had wrestled a few times. Because we there are times where me and him were cool initially. But he kind of, we had that falling out. And he likes to go for a headlock. You know, so <laughs> his go he tries to pull my head down. And he kind of does get me in a headlock. But I kind of, I go to the guard defense. So he can't get on top of me and try to elbow or punch. And we're kind of at a standstill on the ground. He's got me in a headlock. I got him held to where he can't really hit me. So, you know, and at that point, finally, five minutes had probably passed. The CO's coming, finally. Or they see him out in the hallway through the glass. There's, like, glass you can see in the hallway. And, uh, you know, finally, they come and they're like, yo, yo, CO, CO, CO's. So we get up, we jump on our racks. It's obvious we've just been fighting, you know. The one has a unicorn knot, the other one's lips bleeding, you know, Kevin's lips bleeding, Paul's got the unicorn knot, I'm sitting on my bunk, out of breath, I probably got a few red marks from brushes and scrapes and stuff on the ground and hitting that door, but I never got hit in my face, never once did I get connected with a fist to my face, very close, Paul actually did throw an uppercut and I blocked it, I don't know how I got very lucky, I never got connected in my face once. And uh, even though he did try to, boom, hit me with an uppercut, because that would have rocked my chin pretty good, man. But um, sit on, oh, man, someone's shooting a pistol off in the distance. Sorry about that, that distraction. But anyways, uh, we're sitting on our bunk, and they see me and Paul hop up. So we're automatically the suspects. They walk in. They say, what the hell's going on in here? <laughs> you know, you got a big old dip of chewing tobacco in his mouth, fat boy. Called him Cupcake, and there was another CO, I forget his name, but they called the one Cupcake, fat boy with dip, kind of a good old country boy, he wasn't a bad CO. And uh, they said, Paul, Pennell, that's my last name, pack your shit, let's go. And uh, Kevin never got busted. Kevin never got busted. They suspected him, I'm pretty sure they were watching the cameras all the time, watching the fight before, you know, they probably were like betting on it, let's see who wins, you know. And uh, we're like, Kev, we know you had something to do with this. He's like, I didn't have shit to do with it. And they never took him to the hole. But they took me and Paul to the hole for a week, which is hell. It's an empty, barren room with a toilet and metal sink that's connected to each other. You get a mat and a blanket. Technically, during the day, if they want to, if you're being the worst in trouble, they can take the mat and blanket for you and give it, only give it back to you at nighttime. But they never did that to us, fortunately. No reading material. If you're in there for more than a week, you can get a, a Bible, which I was only in there for a week, so, you know, I didn't get a Bible to read. But uh, you get letters sent in, you get allowed to read it, and you got to give it back to them. But fortunately, I was able to keep it. My mom had wrote me, you know, and I just hid it under my mat, you know, and they never took it back from me. It's like, what are you going to do with a piece of paper, you know? But while I was in there, the only things you could order was, at that point, is hygiene. They put all your commissary food and, um, in your property temporarily while you're in there you get it back when you get out so i was ordering hygiene like envelopes to write letters and i bought a pair of shoes because i knew this jail is about fighting it's about business i had seen numerous people get hurt bad their ass kicked who's jumped on the poker table black dude ace man he could fight but they had to jump him to beat him black dude he had some hands man he could fight and it took you know two of them jumping him to to beat him and one of them was really big, and the other one was Paul. But they uh, had some shoes, man. And when you got those shoes on, people respect you a little more. They know you bought them shoes for a reason. And after that, people thought twice. I changed my whole demeanor. The whole time I was in the hole, I knew that was kind of a traumatizing experience for me. I'll be honest. It changed my whole perspective on jail and my whole way of dealing with altercations. And I was from that point forward, any time I did time, 
that whole pass of Sawyer went out the window. And to this day, it's changed me. It was kind of somewhat traumatic, man. I'm much more apt to fight now, I'm much more apt to be aggressive if I feel a situation calls for it. Like I said, I'm not trying to claim to be a tough guy, but I'm way more apt to use my hands if I need to, you know. And I won't think twice if someone gets physically aggressive or threatens me, you know, or, or my friends or family, you know. But um, <clears throat> Paul's in the hole next to me, you know, we kind of talk it out, squash it. We end up, by the end of the week, we end up joking and laughing. You know, after we get out of there, after a week, his nuts kind of almost gone, you know, on his forehead. But uh, we kind of squashed it, you know, and I ended up going to a dorm. Once I got out, I had my shoes. I went to the dorm next door. They didn't put me back in that dorm. But there's a, a door you can kind of talk through the crack. And Kevin's over there running out his mouth. I, I tell him he's a piece of garbage. I tell Matt he's a piece of garbage. You know, they're running them out to me, you know, saying, bitch. I was like, all right, bro. Well, if we ever see each other, we'll deal with it, you know, which we didn't. Which is funny. Kevin actually ended up getting moved into that dorm later on. The dude that screams on his girl. But they told him if there's any issues over there with me, that they're going to put him in the hole for like a month or two months, something like that. I told him. I heard him say that to him at the door. And we almost got into it one time, but... You know, we just kind of left each other alone and respected each other, you know. We had words one on time, you know. That's a whole different, it was just over some dumb stuff. But, you know, we kind of respect each other, left it alone. None of us wanted to go a hole or anything again. He knew I'd fight, I knew he'd fight, so we squashed it. And, um, like I said, ever since that happened, man, it's changed my mentality. I'm fighting, I'm defending myself. And anytime I have to do time or I'm around an aggressive person, Obviously, if someone's got a gun or a knife, you deal with that differently, but I'm always ready to go, man. They say, stay ready so you don't have to get ready, you know? So I try to stay ready, stay in shape, pop, pop, you know? <laughs> but, um, because, man, that changed my life. Like I said, that experience changed my life and my whole outlook on fighting, you know? To this day, you know, I still remember that, but, um... There's times me and Paul ended up going to court on the same van, and we ended up squashing it and laughing about it later on. But that's what happened, man. So it's best to stay out of jail, avoid these situations. Don't do drugs. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't kill. Don't do fraud. Things of that nature. You don't ever have to deal with these things. But I hope you guys enjoyed this story. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking, subscribing, following, sharing commenting on the video, any interaction, engagement, uh, I'd appreciate, and I just want you all to know I love y'all, um, thanks for watching Sawyer P, or Grow With Me Sawyer P, where we grow together and not apart, y'all have a good night, take care, fuck out.